just our presence destabilizes everything. So I think that that, that alone.
Good afternoon. Uh, it looks like we're here live. I want to thank all of you for arriving in this virtual space together for our second dialogue in a new series at NMSU called Imagining and Shaping a Borderlands Pluriversity. I'm going to share my screen really quickly. This is, uh, can people see this flyer? Mm -hmm. Um, we're here with uh, Dr. Timothy Nelson today, and I wanted to share this so that all of you can see we've had one speaker, uh, a set of speakers on February 10th, and um, coming up on March 31st, we have Dr. Rabab Abdulhadi and April 14th, Dr. Antonio Duran. If you'd like to uh, listen to Dr. Luna and Dr. Gray Shields talk, it's recorded and you can um, find it on chicano.nmsu.edu and scroll down to uh, latest speaker. So, so thank you and, and um, stop sharing. Uh, so please tune in, look out for our emails and our uh, reminders. However you got a hold of, of this announcement, we'll be um, keeping everyone up to date. Uh, thank you all so much for being here today. Hi, I'm Dulcinea Lara. I'm a many generations native of the Southern New Mexico borderlands region. On both of my parents' sides, we're rooted in indigenous ancestry and also claim Chicana, Chicano, Mexican-American identity, going back six and seven generations on this land before it became a borderlands. I'm also director of the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies program here at NMSU um, and a really excited member of the emergent group calling ourselves the Pluriversity Imagination Collective. We're a collective facilitating an intellectual and feminist inquiry about how to de-link from structures of colonialism, racism, heteronormativity, and the overall colonial matrix of power. In light of the current state of humanity, we're inviting ourselves and all of you to think otherwise um, about how we can function as a place of learning together and solving problems together. We imagine a space of learning and problem solving founded on an ethics um, and a practice of generativity rather than productivity, collectivity rather than individual rigor, abundance rather than scarcity, and equity rather than meritocracy. So rather than a university that promotes singular um, and linear ways of making knowledge, we're imagining a borderlands pluriversity, a place of knowledge making that requires expansiveness epistemic diversity, and the celebration of a human and land-centered framework. As a land-grant and Hispanic-serving and minority-serving institution on indigenous land, our collective pushes beyond institution-stated land acknowledgements to be in respectful and reciprocal relationships with indigenous people living here, whose knowledges are vital to the health and thriving of this region, its people, plants, animals, water, and all living things. I want to thank the sponsors of this dialogue series, Chicano Programs, the College of Arts and Sciences Equity Fellows, the Southwest and Border Cultures Institute, and the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies Program. We look forward to making this a recurring series and welcome new sponsors as we grow. Um, please email any of us organizers um, if you'd like to join. Thank you to my sister scholars in the Pluriversity Imagination Collective, Dr. Manal Hamse, Dr. Judith Flores Carmona, and Dr. Georgina Badoni. I'm grateful to be working with you all as we persevere in cultivating a spirit of kindness, one of coexistence and re-existence, and as we work together to restore dignity and justice in all the spaces we inhabit. The group is porous. We're open to collaboration uh, with visionaries who are rooted and committed to equity and land-based indigenous knowledge and pedagogies of resistance. There's plenty of room at the table. And last but never least, to our tech guru, Jonathan Moreno, uh, we couldn't be here without you. Uh, thank you for all the work to get us here today. And now for our wonderful guest, I'm so happy and pleased um, to invite Dr. Timothy Nelson to Virtual Las Cruces uh, to share his research wisdom and a little bit about the ways that he's thinking about and expressing about today's state of affairs. Dr. Nelson's talk today is titled, The Significance of the Afro Frontier, 1900 through 1930, Blackdom. 
Dr. Sh Timothy E. Nelson's multifaceted work concerns racism, ambition, and the search for opportunity. These themes were revealed in his 2015 PhD dissertation, The Significance of the Afro Frontier. Dr. Nelson was born in South Central Los Angeles, raised in Compton during the early 1990s in the wake of race and class-based conflict with the LAPD. He earned his PhD from UTEP, the University of Texas at El Paso. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Nelson for a presentation that will be followed by discussion and then Q&A um, dialogue with our audience. So Dr. Nelson, take it away. Thank you for having me. Thank the Pluriversity for existing. Uh, I'm going to start off and I want us to get a little comfortable. This is a pandemic that we're in, so I want to uh, start off a little light. So we're going to start off with Compton College. That's where I first started my college career. But I'm going to focus in on this sign as you leave Compton College. This is Compton. So where does the guy or gal or anything in between fit on the horse? What is the idea behind this horse and this person on the horse in Compton and a slash through it. And this is Compton College. I want you to think of it as the Compton Cowboys have been here. So today I want you to think of how did Compton get its Cowboys? Okay, so I want you to just meditate on that part. The summer of 2020 began with the racial violence similar to the assaults perpetuated during the summer of 1920, 1919, a period often referred to as Red Summer. Black people on horseback, born and raised in Compton, was a vivid show of anti-racist force. And here is a picture, I'm gonna go in a little bit closer. Okay, it was a whole posse. And you can see it's a long distance. Okay, 14 hours, 44 minutes if you're driving 921 miles away from Chavez County. Okay. June 9th, 2020, black cowboys and cow girls from Compton graced the pages of the New York. Times under the headline, Evoking History, Black Cowboys Take to the Streets. For people who grew up in the Hub City, it was more of our reality. Leaving the Afro frontier to occupy spaces in places like Southern California, Harlem, Oakland, to engage the American Roaring 20s, Black cowboys continued to maintain a vibrant culture amongst themselves. A historical narrative sickness has concealed the brief period at the turn of the 20th century when Black people preserved their internal structures behind the Du Boisian veil of double consciousness. We won't go over the whole African diaspora, but I want to start there because the Blackton thesis begins with the American Revolution. And I'm gonna go here. I'm not gonna talk about it much in the formal, but I just want you to understand that these two people, okay, Prince Hall and Bishop Richard Allen, during the post-revolutionary war era, decided to break away from the white consciousness in Philadelphia. So. Bishop Richard Allen create, uh, uh, started with his parishioners, the AME Church. Uh, Prince Hall broke away from the white Freemasons and created black Freemasonry. And we can go further. Where did it extend to, though? I'm going to start with that, is Liberia. Okay. So that same triad of ministers, military men, I'm going to go here, military Freemasons and ministers. That's the revolutionary triad that continues throughout the 1800s that few of us talk about in, in conjunction with one another. And you see this in Liberia, the colony in Liberia, 1821. You see ministers, military men, and Freemasons. 
and it also became uh, independent from the US. We can go on about that. But again, I'm just getting you there so that you understand where the Blackton thesis comes from. This isn't uh, the normal uh, directional um, west to east or westward expansion. This is the African diaspora. So in this, you have westward expansion and you also have the before northward expansion. So instead of just the 1619 project, you also have to include the 1519 project in the um, creation of what we call mixed call. Blackton was a real place located in the southeastern section of the New Mexico territory. The Afro frontier town was part of a black colonization movement that operated on a continuum influenced by ministers, military men, and Freemasons. After the Plessy decision, okay, this is the town square here, and this is the Boyer family inside of the town square. Okay. And you see Turner Street, Douglas, and you see Lincoln. So this is their town square. After the Plessy decision established the separate but equal doctrine, black institutions evolved to take advantage by encouraging a separate and equal response. Blackton was a real place that started with an inherited idea. The Alpha Frontier town manifested at the turn of the 20th century for African descendants underneath, under the conditions of American blackness. The idea of blackdom developed throughout the 19th century. In the 20th century, although blackdom existed as a town for a brief moment, self-determination and how to achieve it were exemplified in the experiment. Significant to the black and ambitious, Blackdom Townsite was a proof of concept for how to deliver on the promise of God's sovereignty. I don't know if many are aware of black colonizers, but they exist. So we want to first go to where Blackdomites colonized, and it is the Mescalero Reservation. Okay, even though it's quote Chavez County, this is Apache land. Okay, Roswell, Artesia, that whole block, the, the, the uh, Pecos River is also there too. This is the Pecos, Pecos Valley Ridge. In practice, black demites pulled land to build a 10,000 person, all black municipality. At the core of their movement was homesteading process. That homesteading process uh, is what we, We'll discuss a little bit later. This is the census. Okay. Just so you can see it. Now, Negroes, 1900. Less than 100. Chavez County, and this is Bernalillo. You can see Bernalillo and Chavez County. Okay. From the state of Washington to South Carolina, Black Demites advertised the organization of Afrotopia. And we won't read it, but this is the article that was sent across from um, state to state. If you want to, we can read it later in the question and answer. The Santa Fe New Mexican reported on September 9th, 1903, the incorporation of the Blackton Townsite Company. It's art articles of incorporation with the 13 men and their intentions. And this is the names of the 13. And I, and I emphasize 13 because often uh, the narrative only allows for Frank Boyer and maybe Ella, a few other people. But I'd like you to really understand that there were 13 founders of, of the Black and Townsite Company. Frank was uh, the more prominent because he was a minister, a military man, and a Freemason.
These are Homestead records. Isaac Jones, Black and Townside Company's first vice president, began his homestead in April of 1903. In 1905, Isaac Jones became the first Black Demite co-founder to complete a homestead. The basic process took three to 10 years. I want you to look in on this eighth, this question eight. And it says, is your present claim within the limits of an incorporated town? I'll get closer over here. Okay. Or selected site for a city or town or used in any way to trade for trade and business. And it says no sir here. And this is the vice president of the Blackton Townsite Company. So in, in, in that one question, you see the early years of Blackton kind of there and not there, people involved and not involved. So that was kind of what I call the lost years. It was lost to the struggle of homesteading and people doing their own thing. Cause you know, trying to get 13 people together or 13 families together, it's pretty difficult. Blackton was revived as a way to mitigate the impact of New Mexico's impending statehood and the shift from federal to local power. Blackton's elite owned land, but owning land wasn't enough. Blackton's elite was located 20 miles south of Roswell. Blackton was a small enclave of land-owning Black people. Blacktonites needed a collective action to deliver on the promise of their intersection. And I want to go back here for a moment. Here is Blackton. And along this road, this, 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 this right here is where the Roswell Correctional Facility is. I, I, it's not there now, but I'll show you later if, if we get a chance. During Blackton's revival after 1909, Blackton included the significant striving of Black women as they began participating in the homestead process more fully. Maddie Moore, Pernisha Russell, Ella Boyer were a few who chose to engage the world as part of Blackton's homestead class. Blackton's growth intensified with passage of the Homestead Enlargement Act in 1909. The township increased enough that Blacktonites organized a school and reached out to the territorial government for curriculum. And I'll show you here, this is the Enlargement Act. I'll try to zoom in here. Okay. Okay. See that? One half mile to extreme length. So it went from 160 acres to 320. And this is Blackton. And here's uh, the Roswell Correctional Facility in Blackton Commons, less than three miles away. Revival included educating the next generation by also projecting an intersectional blackness from behind the Du Boisian veil. For two years, Harold Coleman, a newspaper ads man from back east, led an advertising campaign published in the Crisis Magazine. Separate and equal, Black Demites projected intentional blackness and God's sovereignty. After a few privileged black travelers made their way to Blackdom, reported back to the migrating ambitious black masses, Blackdom became a beacon for the illuminated. The revival, Blackdom became a real place and more than a refuge. Blackdomites preferred farmers to 
city folk for the sake of increased production. Everyone was required to adjust to the steep learning curve of dry farming. The Agricultural Society was a community set on living by God's divine laws of sowing and reaping. Seed time and harvest time were different on desert prairies, but the ambitious frontier scheme was refined into a process with predictable outcomes for investors. In 1914, As a signee for Maddie and Pernicia, Frank Boyer completed the land patent for Blackdom's 40 acre town square. On August 11th, 1916, the Rio Grande Republic reported, George Malone was admitted to the New Mexico bar, the first Negro to do so. Blackdom's revival backdrop included the Mexican Revolution raging in the borderlands as the U.S. entered into world war. Pushed to the forefront, Black children were conscripted into military service. People under the conditions of American Blackness, patriotic to a separate but equal system, Black Demites put the future of the small village on hold and shifted their activities 20 miles north into Roswell. Meanwhile, 20 miles north in Roswell, many more went from famous to hyper visible to infamous. As patriotism fueled the war effort, the new era became a rationalization for raids on her body business at 201 South Virginia Ave. During the shift to Roswell, the image of black people was under assault across the world with D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, black bodies under the constant threat in the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan. In the Roswell Daily Record, Roswellian leaders advertised the showing of Birth of a Nation and offered lectures on Americanism, which was grooming for before incorporating uh, the first Klan chapter in the city. Many more became the antithesis of the new patriotic fervor of the citizen soldier. Un uh, she occupied the black female public in image in the region. Meanwhile, on July 21st, 1917, the Roswell Daily Record reported Ezell Ragsdale had been drafted from the unincorporated Afro frontier town. And the family prepared him for deployment, which included putting his homestead on hold. The women of Blackdom did their part on all fronts. One of their major tasks was to diversify the black female image in Chavez County. The women of Blackdom hosted a few inter-ethnic bandage knitting parties for the troops on the front lines. Curiously, the women of Blackdom staged the intersectional gathering in the window on Main Street. Nevertheless, November 1st, 1917. In the fall of 1917, Mitty led the, the headlines on, Main Street. on trial for attempted murder of her fiance. And you can see here, she's a Teflon Don, guilt not proven. But what she did was, <laughs> John Wilson aggravated her enough that she pulled out her revolver and shot two holes in his coat, missing him completely.
Mitty was on the margins of Blackton society and Blackton women were in her periphery. Mitty stayed unaffiliated prior to 1919, even though she began a homestead in 1915, three miles south of Blackton Town Square. She needed witnesses to vouch for her homestead progress under the threat of federal perjury charges and the new Blackton leadership legitimized her claim. Meanwhile, in the spring of 1922, Mitty completed her final homestead proof for a whole square mile south of Blackton. By the summer, Blackton, Blacktonites, the Blackton faithful sold their church and a lot of them uh, migrated outward. Ella and half of the Boyer family moved to Vado. Now, I want to emphasize this before I go further. This is the difference between everything else you will ever read that wasn't written by me. Although there was an exodus from Blackton after 1919, the town business was stronger than ever. The next generation took over as America entered the roaring 20s in post-war euphoria. December 31st, 1919, the Roswell Daily Record reported, Will pool acreage. Blacktonites incorporated the Blackton Oil Company in 1919. Half of the Blackton faithful left by 1922. But there, were, there was business taking place in Roswell. I'm finished. Uh, any questions? I can go further, but this is where we stop on, on the lecture part. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Nelson. Um, I saw some comments in the chat that this is so impactful and this is why we need to know our history. Um, you gave us a really deep dive analysis of how Blackdom uh, came to be and how it started in operation um, as a community, but also a business. Can you pull back the lens just a little bit and give those of us who don't know the basic narrative of Blackdom a sense for the why of New Mexico? Um, why was New Mexico attractive um, in the settling of what was called the Black Utopia? What was the draw in, in this area? Uh, for for black mites, um, the hmm, economic boom in the southeastern section of New Mexico, I mean, it, it's considered the uh, economic engine at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, a lot of uh, Hagerman's son becomes the governor, I believe, during this time period. So the southeastern section is being built up using uh, irrigation. So you, so you see the importation of laborers, okay, the exploitation of labor, the exploitation of land. Uh, and, and you also have various irrigation projects. So what you have is a influx of settlers and then you have settlers and then you have um, the increase of uh, different sections of society having to exist together. And once the water was there, it, it continued to grow. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically how, why they went. It was, it was about the economics of it all. Thank you. Um, so I, 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 this, this conversation's uh, really exciting. I, I think that the basic understanding of Blackdom New Mexico isn't part of the New Mexico um, curriculum. It's not part of the public discourse. So thank you for your research. Um, I'd like to first talk about methodology as, as we're thinking about pluriversity and multiple ways of approaching uh, knowledge production. What are the tools and approaches you use to explore um, scholarly questions about Black identity and Black communities in, in the borderlands? Uh, I, I begin to, um, I, I start with skepticism. One, I assume that any narrative I'm reading about Black people, particularly in the borderlands, has a tinge of um, white supremacy. 
and not always coming from a, uh, a, a, um, a body that is white. It could be coming from a black person, a descendant. It doesn't matter. The narrative has been infected by this white supremacy. So to get out of the white consciousness, you have to start with the skepticism. So you look deeper into the materials. You look deeper into the artifacts, the documents. All of the elements of history, um, they, they can't sit alone. You have to add the ontology of the people. And so if, after you get with the skeptic, skepticism, you then add what was the intentionality of the agents of history. And so that begins my, my, my progress uh, in, in changing the narrative. It doesn't matter the uh, intentions of the author. It really doesn't. Um, because white supremacy, it, it, it affects, it infects the whole body. And the only way to get out of it is to uh, quarantine yourself. Thank you. Um, I've seen you in uh, some spaces around the conversation to reimagine the history curriculum for K-12 here in New Mexico. And, and I, can, you, can you talk a little bit about how your work helps us understand race in New Mexico overall, um, especially as, as I start to see these um, debates happening around how do we rewrite New Mexico history? Um, there's concerns about dilution, there's concerns about, um, you know, uh, the either or kind of narratives. And so, so that's part one. And then part two, you mentioned black colonizers. You talked about um, indigenous sovereignty and black sovereignty. So, so after you answer the first question, I wanna leap into the complexity of what you're presenting. Um, the, the, the black colonizer thing caught me off guard. So you're gonna have to uh, say the first question real quick again. The first question is, um, how does your research and your work help, help us understand race? Okay, right, right, okay. Uh, the first one, I'll, and I'll just include the uh, black colonizer part of it. Uh, what it says is that um, black isn't a race. It's a consciousness, just like whiteness. And the key to, it, to, to, to understanding black people in the borderlands is to understand black people are in the borderlands already because blackness is a condition and it's a condition easily put on people with skin like mine but the first blackness was in uh uh uh, uh put upon the indigenous peoples uh before 1519 so um, so that's how I begin to uh, reimagine blackness even in the borderlands. Uh, even though there is African ancestry, to have that black body in the borderlands changes it. There's a frontier alchemy that happens when you're here. For example, if you were in Georgia farming, what do you think is going to happen when you go to southeastern New Mexico and start farming? It's going to be a whole different attitude, consciousness, it changes your body, it changes the way that you understand yourself. You used to think, oh, the sun is not that bad in Georgia. You come here and try to just do what you did over there, you're gonna have to change a little bit and it changes the conscious. You're gonna have to learn how to eat chili, number one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, we have- Oh, the other one, the, uh, there's another question there about, what was it about? The, the question I have is, uh, it's coming in in different ways from the chat. Okay. I'm gonna kind of okay. like try to incorporate what people are asking. Um, we have a question from Michael Ray. Um, he says, thank you for bringing up different types of colonization as we work to create new educational systems. Um, is there a need to wrestle with the concept of oppressed becoming the oppressors? Yes, period. Yes, however we do that, we must do that. What is happening here in New Mexico right now is colonized peoples, colonized bodies are now becoming a minstrel show for the colonizers, okay? Um, you have, we, we talk about the tricultural narrative, but a tricultural narrative here can, it often ends up, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. 
So the colonization continuum just keeps rolling over and over and it's 2021 and we don't have ethnic studies. Along those lines, um, I'm, I'm following what's happening at the New Mexico state legislature and there's multiple um, legislations being introduced that would implement ethnic studies uh, pre-K through college in the state of New Mexico, um, which is exciting. I, I've also seen the politics play out where there's being, it's being proposed that there would be an either or, a New Mexico history requirement or ethnic studies. And so can you, can you, can you sort of uh, react to that? I am a substitute teacher. Well, kind of, I mean, with the COVID, I'm not, I'm, I don't know where I am. But uh, I teach in the Santa Fe Public Schools and I'm, uh, because I'm a sub. And I went through the social studies and um, it's difficult to read. Uh, the, 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 ha. Huh. It's, 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 it's destructive. It's displacing. Uh, the kids, it's, it's displacing their consciousness of themselves. It's also leaving, it's leaving marks and pushing them out of the intellectual economy. Um, yeah, it, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult. What, what, yeah, it's difficult. It's a bigger I'm just going to leave it there because I have, a, I, I have uh, feelings about it and I'm trying not to project them here. It is, it is 2021 and we do not have ethnic studies in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, we have some great comments and questions coming in. Um, I think one of your, your former mentors from UTEP, Dr. Jeff Shepard uh, says, great work, Dr. Nelson. Where do you envision this multidisciplinary high-tech project going? It's a long way from a wonderful dissertation. Oh, it's going to Hollywood. I don't know when or where, uh, but it's kind of hard not to. So, I mean, if you, that is where it's going. Yeah, big future ahead when we'll get to your, your, um, your artistic expressions here in a little bit. Um, another question, uh, lots of excellent work, Dr. Nelson. Thank you for your work. This is why we need to know history, history. Um, a question from Dr. Cynthia Pellick. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Can you speak to connections between the Buffalo soldiers of the 19th century in New Mexico and Blackdom, New Mexico? Mm, so this is the black colonizer for you. Okay, the question about black colonizers, I'm glad you brought this. Uh, black people, black soldiers became the first border patrol for the most part. So I'll give you an example. Frank Boyer, I told you about him before, minister, military man, and Freemason were the military man. He was at Fort Huachuca in Arizona. He helped to plat it, which means uh, he was part of the colonizing force. And because it was an all black military unit with black officers, this military installation um, became a part of the colonization in the colonization continuum. And they were on the forefront of transforming Mexico's northern frontier into the US Western frontier. They, although they were small in number, they had an outsized influence on the genocidal campaigns, whether in Mexico, so-called Mexico, and also in the so-called US. So, the, so, and also you can go to uh, Columbus, New Mexico, and there's also, a military installation there that um, made up of the 24th Infantry and the, and uh, Pancho Villa's raids there was against black folks. But you know, there's a reason why black folks were the colonizers. So, um, but to New Mexico, uh, Frank Boyer was a military man and he was a Buffalo soldier. Buffalo soldiers helped to also uh, commit the campaign. Commit the genocidal campaigns against the uh, Apache, uh, Mescalero Apache, uh, 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 um, and as they were colonizing the the Blackton town site, they were part of 
walling in that reservation. So, so you can say somebody's on a reservation, but now those counties that built up became the borders of reservation land. So that's how it went. Um, when Blackdom uh, struck oil, one of the first contracts they signed for oil exploration was with the Mescalero Oil Company. And I'm not sure who was made up of it, but because of where it is, I assume it's uh, part of the indigenous uh, economics. Thank you. Um, you. You use the tool of intersectionality. I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but we've talked about it. Um, intersectionality plays a big role in your, your methodology. Can you expand on why uh, we need to move beyond studying groups of people in um, what I would consider isolated or insular ways? Um, and then there's a part two, so so just <laughs> okay. intersectionality, because I mean, you're already giving examples, but can you say more about that? If we continue to just say that's black, that's Mexican, uh, we, will, we, we, are, we are using the, the tools of the master. Okay, so in order to decolonize and then be sovereign, we have to come up with a new way. So we focus on the consciousness of people. And in, in, in the way that I use intersectionality, I focus on the consciousness. Uh, so there are outcomes to a consciousness. And that way you can begin to look at who is what. So I'll give you an example. In Blackdom, I talk about intersectional blackness. Mitty Moore Wilson, the infamous madam shooter gun she was a shooter she was a a, a bootlegger a, a gunslinger so on and so on she was not a black demite until 1919 well why because it was built on something else so they excluded her too right so so again it helps us to build a story based on the people rather than the projections upon the people and we undergird the agency of people because we're talking about why they do what they do when they do it you know so yeah thank you um for for talking about agency and i love your use of um the concept of ambition right mm -hmm. um so so far for, for you know what you've presented um to me feels like a very successful story of um, of a black community, a black enterprise um, that later goes from blackdom to vado partially. And so, can, you know, can you talk about the challenges? Like what was the reception for these 13 um, people coming um, all the way from Georgia, I believe, or from the South, parts of the South? What was the reception? Um, because so far it seems like it was pretty easy going. Um, and I know it's complicated. So, so can you speak to that? Because I feel like history can get so, so sort of sim simplified. And, and, and can you speak to that? Okay. Uh, their reception. Um, southeastern section of the New Mexico territory was a Confederate stronghold. So that tells you most of what you need, but this is New Mexico. So it being New Mexico, it was a territory, not a state when Blackton began, which meant that federal laws applied, not local laws. And so if you're looking at Jim Crow, you can't necessarily, for the most part, enforce Jim Crow laws in a territory. Black folks knew that. As soon as you cross the Pecos River, because you know, it's little Texas, as soon as you cross the Pecos River, you didn't have to worry about segregation. So Roswell wasn't segregated. However, there was a white consciousness in Roswell. That white consciousness is what black folks had to deal with, which meant that they were only allowed or for the most part only allowed to be maids, porters, cooks, yada, yada, yada. So if you wanted to be free, you wanted to be free, you could be free to be a cook. But on the edge of Afrotopia is what Roswell was for a lot of people, including Isaac Jones, who lived on, uh, I think it's South Main Street. No, he lived on Kentucky Street. So that's the consciousness right there. Isaac Jones, the vice president of the Black and Townside Company, lived on Kentucky Street. He's, he's a minister, so he had a, a, a messianic zeal for life. And so he said, I'm going to go to the promised land. And he did, he had to leave, but why did he leave? Because he could only be a cook 
How, how do I know that? Because there's also a founder of Blackdom who decided not to continue after he signed the Articles of Incorporation. He stayed in Roswell for 30 years and he was a cook for 30 years. In every census record, he was still a cook. Even though he had 11 kids, still a cook, same house. So he had a choice and he missed out on the Blackdom Oil Company, I assume. It's, I mean, possibly he got in somehow, some way, but he missed out on the boom times because he decided he was gonna be free in Roswell instead of sovereign in Blackdom. Oh. Thank you. Um, a couple of comments from our audience. Um, Ashley Adams gives you uh, props for your presentation. Um, she sat with you on the Western Historical Association panel um, regarding her work on Nicodemus, another all black town. So, so thank you for being here, um, Ms. Adams. Another comment uh, from My Mariposa 78, uh, a 2015 survey estimated the Afro-Mexican population at 1.3 million, mostly in Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Veracruz states. This is connected to the question about mestizaje, not until 2015, imagine. So, so really um, throwing important information out there to complicate the question and, and have us uh, think more deeply about these um, constructed categories of race um, that exist differently in different nation states. So thank you I, for I, the comments. I, I use that, I, I use that uh, census, that, that half, half decade census, where uh, for the first time, African descendants were able to necessarily call themselves black. That was revolutionary. And it also should explain to you why all of a sudden there's build that wall. Because understand, very few, very, very few people can, quote, replace. Remember when they were going through Charlotte and they said, Jews will not replace us? Well, in the borderlands, Mexicans will not replace us. It's a, it's a similar concept. And if Mexicans are not yielding to white supremacy and then saying, I'm going to call myself Black, I'm going to call myself Afro, whatever, that is fearful of, uh, of, of, of a white, the white consciousness is fearful of that because the things that went on before can't now. Mimin Pinyin is not gonna work no more. You can't put that on a stamp and think people are gonna think that's okay. Thank you. Um, we can see how these questions of knowledge production outside the linear practice, outside the, the rigorous practice um, that we're used to with the westernized practices of knowledge production are traversing all kinds of borders. So, so thank you for that. Um, another question came in from Cynthia Wise. She says, Dr. Nelson, thank you for your presentation. Can you speak to the educational segregation that existed in Doñana County that resulted in the Boyers um, School in Vado? So going back to the, the mention you made to Vado, New Mexico, and maybe you can talk a little bit about who left Blackdom, why Vado again, like why settling okay. in Vado? Um, and those who are on the call, um, who may not know where Vado is, we're here in Las Cruces, New Mexico, about uh, 45 minutes away from El Paso, and Vado is kind of right in the middle in New Mexico. So can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, the segregation in Doña Ana County in general, um, I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to put it this way. It may be a little different than we've heard it, but uh, Black folks was like, who cares? You're talking about New Mexico versus the South. So <laughs> you have a little bit more leeway in Doniana County, even more so than you did in Chavez County, which I told you was a stronghold for the Confederacy. Here's the other thing about Vado and Doniana County, the military. Black people used to go through Vado in order to get to uh, Fort Selden. It's, is it Fort Selden? That's it, okay. So they would go through Vado because there, there was no I-10 to Fort Selden. And so Vado became a place where black military men were free. They didn't necessarily go to Doniana because they had the, you know, the, the turn down laws or the, what is it? The, the, light, the sundown laws, right? And then you had the, so I'm just gonna say, once you quarantine yourself, none of those laws matter. See, what we do too much is we ask for permission. And, and back then, 
they didn't ask for permission. They just did what they did according to the law. Okay, so colonization depends on the law, and what they did is twist the law. I'm not going to say twist the law. They use the laws to their advantage. For example, instead of separate but equal, they went separate and equal. Not equal to a society that they saw that was immoral, uh, that, that, that had no kind of soul, equal under the law. So in Vado, they were able to do that. And it was also better than dealing with the Pecos. You have the Rio Grande River, you know, you have the real it's it's different water systems so they were they they it was a, it was a happier time and they and they were able to use the royalty money to guarantee their success i really appreciate this um i grew up in Berino, new mexico which is a neighbor to vado and um there was no understanding of the history of that region at all in my um, experience in education. And just knowing this is um, incredibly moving psychologically um, in terms of our, our relationship to space, our relationship to communities. There's a lot of um, internal uh, fighting between the colonias of which town is this and which town is that. And so, um, so this kind of information goes a long way just to figure out those, those wounds, those relationships, those histories. Um, and I'm very interested in, in learning more about Vado. So I, I look forward to those conversations. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit to your multifaceted, multidimensional, um, Dr. Shepard touched on it, this kind of high-tech, futuristic um, expression of this work that's really fabulous. Um, you're a historian and an artist, um, and can you talk about how artistic expression is an integral part of um, changing the ways that we learn and the ways that we relate to each other. Like how important is art as a central piece and, and how can we embed that in the, the ways that we're re-envisioning how we learn and what we teach? Um, assume that the agents of history have a soul. Um, and, and the minute you do that, you can see in a newspaper article what happened to them or what they did or what they got as far as land. But if you know they have a soul or they have an inner something, not just a skin, not just a body, not just a shell, then you can begin to go, oh, like, for example, Mitty Moore sh shot two holes in her fiance's coat, missing him. So. I tell that story, but I also say, what do you think her fiance did? And you start thinking about that and that is where we get the artistry. Being on the margins or being black or being uh, conscious, not of the white consciousness, but conscious allows that artistry to come out in any way, shape or form. It could be writing, it could be painting, it could be uh, singing, it could be serving. There's an art to serving. Um, so just assume <laughs> that there's a soul behind all this, these people we're talking about, these names, these uh, change the names. You know, what does it mean to change a name? I mean, there's a lot of these pieces that once you pick up, it's, it's hard not to see a person. It's not, it's hard not to have an artistic reaction. The problem is institutions, not the pluriversity, of course, uh, but institutions like to say, nope, just do it this way. And you do it that way and they go, okay, great. But it's not useful for nobody where you come from. So I'm from Compton. So I had to find Mitty because I was like, I'm not going to do Blackdom. You can talk to Jeff Shepard. He's on tier two. Get, let him get in. He'll tell you. I wasn't going to do Blackdom at all if it continued to be like what you read on Wikipedia. And because it's on Wikipedia, I said, OK, now I'm going to disrupt Wikipedia. So let me tell you this artistic uh, uh, trajectory. I look at Wikipedia as a historian. I say, this is ugly. So I tried to change it as a historian. And they uh, sent me an email and said, nope, and then changed it back to the old narrative. And if you go to that narrative, there's no such thing as Black Demoyle, because I was the one who saw that black people had a soul and continued looking for more in the evidence, okay? So 
Wikipedia has a page. That page automatically creates a page in Facebook. Do you see how institutions are working together? So that public Blackton page has the narrative that is of a white consciousness and it's protected by these companies. So I created a company in order to challenge them. So if you go to Blackdom on Facebook, Instagram, you're gonna see me, my work and the people I know and my friends and just some, some funny stuff. But the idea was to disrupt it because that narrative continues to keep us boxed in. That's, that's once we get out of those boxes, we can do a whole lot, but for it being on social media, it's, it, it, it's, it's it's a costing and if you don't know you just kind of accept it like oh okay it, it it was it failed you know what we're trying to do is get people to, to 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 look at the people and understand what they wanted so on the condition of failure in 1947 in the las cruces sun news i think you know which newspaper that is 1947 frank boyer sits down for an interview and that interview became the basis of this new narrative. Even though I'm giving a new narrative, I'm giving a new narrative that was ignored in the first place. I'll give you one single example. In it, he writes, we are happy, or I am proud of the fact that none of the white and black people had a problem. I'm paraphrasing. Basically, there were, and he also says, there were no lynchings. So every time you look at a Boyer story that talks about a lynching and him running away from Georgia or walking 2,000 miles, what they're trying to do is to get him running away from white people. But he says he wasn't running away from white people. So you see, even in the evidence, you have conflicting understandings. Go with the agency of the people. Thank you. There's so many great questions coming in. I'm having a hard time keeping up with it, but I just want to plug your your enterprise with this beautiful mug. Everyone, go go check out Blackdom Clothing Company. Um, Clothing and productions. We also do plays. We also do all of the above. Entertainment. I'm telling you, that's where it's going. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to take a couple of comments and questions from the chat before I go on with my questions. Um, we have a question from Arturo Campos. What ideas or codes need to be reimagined in order to heal and or nurture the collective soul, stop the language virus from continuing to spread? How do we fight the white supremacist uh, memes slash war? Fight. Stop acting like it's a fair fight and fight. You cannot get away from that consciousness by kowtowing to it or being nice. You're going to have to confront it. That's how we do it. And if you and if you look through some of the some of my postings and that, you know, I, I have a whole a whole trajectory when I'm when I'm fighting that narrative. So you have to have you have to come with the skepticism, right? And you have to have an intention, and your intention is to focus on the agency of the people. When you see that other narrative creeping in, you have to say something, you have to do something. You, you cannot, we, we are no longer allowed to sit around. They stormed the Capitol, okay? So this is not a fight that's gonna end without you being a part of this uh, uh, um, um, fight. So, so questions coming in that, that overlap each other. Um, Ashley Adams asks, uh, what are some tangible actions when you say fight? Um, what are some steps we can take to collectively disrupt the larger misinformed societal narrative that you're speaking of? And she, she says, I realize this is a big question. Um, so, and I think my students ask me this all the time too. What, what can I do? When you say fight, um, can you give me some examples? And, and can you talk about how you're doing that, Dr. Nelson? It, it depends on what you do. Okay, so since I'm a historian, I fight as a historian. Also, when somebody calls me uh, for uh, uh, an expert testimony or something like that in, 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 in ethnic studies, that's where I am, no matter what. I you, you Present yourself as a servant and you will find a place to serve. Mm. The tangible action is service. 
The reason why I wrote the Blackton thesis and continued on with it is because my brother thought I made up Blackton. So because he thought I made up Blackton, I was like, oh, there's a lot of service to do here. And it's not going to be that hard because he's starting from scratch, which means most people are, which means as long as I produce uh, narratives and images that people can connect to, even though they're from the past or, or, or invoking the past, as long as I'm invoking the soul, remember, if people have souls, or if you know that people have souls, and you can invoke that soul, that is the fight. The f okay, so basics here, okay? White consciousness assumes something and that's the fight against it. We, we are the fight against it because the white consciousness wants to erase. And you are constantly saying, I don't want to be erased. <laughs> so in whatever shape or form, you have to make sure that the ontology of the people is not being erased. That's the fight. Now, uh, if you're a writer, then make sure you are using the right language. If you, I mean, I, I can go on with whatever job you're in, but whatever job you're in, when you can see that you are serving the people and undergirding the agency of the people, you're doing the work, period. It doesn't, you don't have to be a, any, you know, it doesn't have to be a big job. It's, it's, it's small things. Cause if, cause, cause, cause the people is the power. And if, if enough people know and are conscious and are moving in that direction, uh, the fight is won already. You've, you, you've mentioned white consciousness a few times. Um, one, can you explain that a bit further? And two, can you talk about its relationship to internalized colonization for, um, for people who inhabit bodies that are labeled and racialized as such? Um, Clarence Thomas, Who, who was the um, uh, Uncle Ben, uh, uh, ben, uh, um, ben Carson? You can see it when you have black bodies making a sound and that sound is making the ravages of white supremacy taste a little sweeter. White consciousness refers to it's not easily defined. I, I kind of, you know, let it float around. But basically, any, any language, any poster, any projection that is dehumanizing to something that is not white is a white consciousness. And we can go uh, into the uh, examples of it. I'll give you the one example. Read my article. It's 500 words. Read my article on blackpast.org that, that gives a synopsis of Blackdom, and then read the first you know, introductory paragraph on Wikipedia. You can see the competing narratives and how the white consciousness sounds completely different than the consciousness that I am using. Thank you. Um, along the same lines, uh, Chelsea Alcantara asks, how do you deal with people in power who are black but side with injustice and more oppression? I guess expanding on what you just um, shared a little bit. Uh, a lot of memes. That that's pretty much it. I mean, people are elected how they're elected. They're they're in their position. They have their power and privilege. Um, just don't feel like you have to bow down to them just because they're whatever their position is. Assume that they have a soul and maybe their soul is a little uh, tainted by their experience. I, I try to come with compassion and I assume that maybe they had something happen. And, you know, I, I have seen people who do it for a job. So let, let's go there. If you have a job, a lot of times you're taking that in because you don't want to lose your job. I mean, uh, I, that's how I lost my job in New Mexico State. I was making sure that I was infusing Blackness in a way that was visible. A lot of institutions don't like visible uh, blackness because uh, it, 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 it shows up differently. Thank you. I'm gonna keep asking questions Go and 
and people keep throwing your, your wonderful questions in the chat. There's a lot of clapping hands. There's a lot of fists, um, lots of lots of people really feeling the power of your words. Thank you. Um, let's talk about institutions for, for a moment. Uh, you're mentioning NMSU, you're talking about um, ways of knowledge production. The organizers of this event and, and our colleagues who, who believe in this way are calling ourselves the Pluriversity Imagination Collective. Um, we're working to, to move from the inside, move the university structure to, to one that's pluriversity or, or one of our guests last uh, month talked about communityversity, which I like that word a lot. How does your work specifically, Dr. Nelson, help us envision a pluriversity? What lessons can we take from your methodology and from what you're sharing? Um, and, and how, what are those needs that need to happen in order to, to make this shift sustainable, right? Right now it's a big moment of mm -hmm. institutions embracing diversity and inclusion and equity um, initiatives. And, and do you see that being sustainable? If, if, and if so, how would that need to, to occur for it to be sustainable within institutions? It's not. Institutions are not gonna accept uh, what is necessary because um, the institutions create a privileged class, period. And that privileged class protects their privilege at all costs. And a lot of them have tenure. So it's not much uh, in, in terms of the, the educational institution specifically. Uh, it is best if you create your own institution as an alternative. And that alternative then follows all of the steps of creating. And once your institution is grounded, go a little bit off campus so you can do and say what you want to do. That's how, uh, that, that is one of the, 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 the biggest things that I see because we keep trying to do it in the institution. We keep trying to be integrationist. Look, we've been integrating for how long now? I mean, at some point, we just got to go. Okay, we're gonna make we're gonna make this an institution, and this institution is gonna make money. If you start making money, and I mean money, you're not gonna have to worry about the institutions uh, 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 pushing you out. They're just gonna want to partner with you, or allow you to come in, or literally allow you to be a subset of a particular department or program or something. But the key is that the people create their own institution and then start bargaining with the institution that they're trying to either disrupt or or or, or um, engage. I think that you know just what pops into mind is uh, the ambition piece of the Blackdom narrative, right? The 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 ambition and the agency that led to a self-sustaining model, right? And and you point to the complicated ways that Blackdom um, survived and didn't survive, but but I think like you're talking a hundred years later about the need to create your own institutions, and I just I see the echo with what's happened um, with Blackdown in New Mexico. So that's that's fantastic. Um, let me let me show you how. Did I tell you the echo of Blackdown was that in that 1947 article, Boyer also confirmed the oil company. That's the other part, I, I forgot to say, that's the second part in that article, confirms the oil company and the royalties that extended into the war, World War II era, okay? 19, he, he died in 1949, his article is in 1947, and he says, oil royalties are still being gotten by black demites in, and, and they're already moved away to California or whatever, but they're still receiving royal. That's that equity when you create your own institution. Otherwise, you're just getting what they give you. And that's not enough to sustain generational wealth or, or, or longevity. What would happen, I, I'll give an example at New Mexico State, what would happen there is uh, because you're trying to work in the institution, uh, I was trying to get a, a black studies program at one point, and what they would do is wait you out. Because remember, students are mostly going to be there, what, four years at the most, five years? Well, for me, it was 10 years at, at, at UTEP, but that's a whole nother story. But generally, you're going to be there four years, or the troublemakers are probably only going to be there two or three. So they try to pacify you. Oh, we'll, gi we'll give you a class. It's online, but we'll give you a class and then next next year we'll have another class and then there's no class next year. 
Why? Because there's nobody there to advocate for that class. Or they set the class up to fail. Like, for example, if you're looking for your classes, usually that happens in the spring, right? You do that with your spring before you leave for summer, and then you already have your classes. Well, guess what? They don't put the Black history class on until a month before school starts. So, of course, it's going to fail. You're not going to get enough uh, uh, ten, uh, people to get it before. It... Anyway, the institutions have a way to always undercut you. So what you have to do is create an institution that once it's undercut, you can now either file a lawsuit or file something, an injun or something to fight on their level because their level is the law. And if you ain't got the law behind you, you lost. I think it's important, uh, thank you, to, to point out that there's a conversa this conversation can happen at many levels. And what you're pointing to very importantly is the structural systemic piece. I think what happens um, oftentimes is people take these kinds of comments or ideas personally or, or, or receive them on the individual level. That's the power of, of his, being a historian is to say over the long arc of time, uh, this is what has been crystallized in the form of an institution, in the form of a system. And I think we run up against that in all institutions, which is people get hurt feelings or they take it personally. And I think that um, what you're offering is a really powerful testament to the, 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 the necessary relationship between historical context and a systemic analysis. So, so thank you. And it's not, that. yeah, yeah. They get, hurt, they get hurt and then they take it out on you because you're a subordinate or some kind of something where we can get you. It's, 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 it's wretched. Um, Marisa Roybal is uh, asking, I don't know if this is a great time, uh, t good time as any, um, can you mention the Harvard Kennedy School panel and tie it into what- Oh, I could talk about that? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so so um, uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School, we've linked up with uh, one of the fellows there, uh, Daryl Cuba. And he is this, uh, uh, he's, well, I, I wanted to call him a journalist, but he's more than that, but he's this brilliant journalist. He was out of New York Times. He also created the disruptwiki.com, I think it was. So me and him already hit off. And this is before he knew me. So when we got together, we got together on the disrupt wiki. Well, now he's disrupting the whole notion of blackness because he's doing an international project on freedom colonies. So freedom colonies, I, I go a little bit beyond freedom colonies, but for, for his, for the project at the Kennedy School, it's mapping it all over the world internationally. And then we're building the, uh, the curriculum and formulas to uh, dissect the evidence that comes with all of the, and, I, and I'll just give you an example of how large it is already. Uh, there's work being done, I, I can't, her name doesn't, ring a bell right now I can't remember her name but in Texas uh, it's they've already mapped uh, 500 freedom colonies in Texas alone so this is going to be an international program and we're coming up I mean the outcome is to do an, another panel a year later and in the mean and, and in that meantime uh, develop a website with all of the references and that kind of thing and um, 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 and then grow it into an institution of its own, right? So this first panel is talking about institutionalizing the project. And then the next one is what is this institution now that we have created it, so. That's so exciting, I look forward to that. Um, more great comments, um, uh, comments about uh, New Mexico State University being land grant HSI, MSI, but pushing critical folks out. A uh, comment from Cynthia Wise, snap, 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 you're spot on, Dr. Nelson. Um, Andrea Roberts is her name, uh, Marisa Roybal, giving you a- Yes, thank you. Okay. you know, I really apologize. For, I'm not good with, I know I'm a historian, but I'm not good with names or dates. So, you know, I, I, you can kind of uh, get me with those. So anyway. Um, and Charlene Shiroti Duran, uh, a former NMSU student, now professor in her own right. This is so powerful. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. I think you may have crossed paths with with Dr. with uh, Charlene. Um, thank you, Charlene. Um, we have uh, about ten minutes left. I'm going to pose a question and and keep looking at the chat. Um, 
thank you for, for being candid and for your comments coming from a place of, of compassion and, and courage. And um, I, I feel like these um, discourses are, are exploding in New Mexico and in this region. And so I'm really happy to be a part of this, um, I think, evolution. Um, so right now there's a, there's a, a, a phenomenon going on um, that's kind of making uh, national headlines. Can you, can you comment, can we chat about the situation surrounding um, arguably one of the most globally recognized public intellectuals of our time, Dr. Cornell West, um, and his departure from Harvard University? Um, what does this moment teach us about the sustainability and, and, the, st and the stability of institutions of higher education um, and, and the effect on scholars of color who are, are doing this work of consciousness raising? You've kind of already touched on this quite a bit, but specifically with what's going on with Dr. West, um, what are your thoughts? I have two, uh, and, and they are contradictory. I'll start with the one that I would say if I was on CNN. He is in a, <laughs> he is in a, a good fight, okay, for the future of Black intellectuals who are constantly demeaned and put in a really tough situation in order to put out really good history or really good intellectual stuff, right? My other response is, you know what would be more powerful is if he would stop, well, I'm not, Harvard isn't the end all. I'm just gonna put it that way. It would have been more powerful if he would have went to Howard. In other words, stop asking them stop asking that consciousness to recognize you it is there to erase so if you want to be recognized go somewhere to be recognized and stop thinking the prestige is enough see uh, you know a lot of us especially people of color um we reach a certain point and we think that uh uh respect should be given by all and then we get faced with things like Dr. West is faced with. He is brilliant. I, I promise you, I watch him consistently and have uh, since Race Matters. And, and, and in the last year, I've watched him probably about 50 different times using a series uh, that he does on Du Bois at Dartmouth. So I am, I mean, he's somebody who, 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 who is in my consciousness and I, I, I wish, this is a wish, so it doesn't mean anything. He would focus in on black folks and just allow the other consciousness to do what it does, how it wants to do it. Because black people have never needed white people. White, the consciousness, is not productive in this particular environment today. So why don't we focus in and mature other uh, uh, other places, other all all of the concentration of our intellectual power should be with people who appreciate it. So that's that's my contradictory to. I think it's a good fight to be there. I, you know, yeah, I think it's a good fight. Considering I'm doing a panel at Harvard, you know, it's just, I get it. But I, I have, you know, like I said on CNN, I would say something different. I want to push you. I want to ask you. Um... Is the, is the consciousness raising that you, the work that you do, um, does that need to happen in all spaces? You're, you're saying, let's go where the, the consciousness is already accepting, right? That, that wants this work, wants this um, artistic expression, is ready to move, you know? And especially coming, uh, speaking in a place like New Mexico, Southern New Mexico right now, um, you know, although um, this institution has many federal designations that require it by law to be responsive to local communities, um, people have talked about this institution as a predominantly white institution. Although our student population is close to 60% people of color, the faculty is closer to 80, 90% white. So, so, you know, can you can you talk about that some more? You know, uh, why can't Cornell West, Dr. West, uh, be at Harvard? You know, you know, do we need public intellectuals that are raising consciousness um, from all walks of life at all the all the institutions, not just institutions of higher ed, but but Hollywood, like you said? You know, 
how do we grapple with that, considering that the spaces are not um, always welcoming? Build your own institution and you don't have to worry about it. I mean, you do, <laughs> but with your own institution, with your own projections, then you have some, okay, I'll give you an example. Cornell West, who doesn't know him? Who doesn't know Dr. West? So why is the stamp and the, and the tenure at Harvard so important? Didn't, he already has tenure at Princeton, right? He already, and I know, yeah, okay, it's the fight. Again, this is my mind. You got two conflicting ideas in my mind because I get why the fight is important, but this is a new era. This is the transition where we can verify ourselves. Verify ourselves. That's a, a powerful, um, a powerful statement. Our communities know how to do it. We know, you know, we know how to talk. We know how to talk to each other. We can also look beyond people's struggles. We can also look beyond the veil, you know? Yes. Thank you. Um, are there any last uh, comments that you'd like to make before we conclude? This has been so powerful. Um, I'm hoping that people who want to continue this conversation can get a hold of you and, and have, a, have a cup of tea over Zoom. Uh, you have so much to offer. So, so is there anything you'd like to, to give us uh, final words, um, Dr. Nelson? Um, the pluriversity uh, is a brilliant uh, beginning. Um, even when you build your own institution, you can then begin to uh, build a privileged class. And as long as the, 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 the privileges don't override the, the uh, motto, the, the, the identity, uh, then, then, then we'll be okay. Every, you know, then, then, then we can um, go beyond uh, the white consciousness that dominates us all. Um, that, so, so that's why I, I believe that's prison. Lastly, just hit me up on social media because uh, I'm a lot more forward even in social media because here I'm trying to be a little bit more specific to Blackdom. Uh, but if you want to uh, sometimes be entertained, please visit me on social media because uh, that's also where my institution mostly reigns because I look at the digital frontier as a frontier. So my job is to colonize. So I colonized um, um, Facebook, definitely. So if you go there, it'll be difficult uh, not to see me in Blackdom um, and Instagram similar. And I'm saying this because I use those platforms in a different way. I use it to build upon these academic things that I do. Because academics can understand what I'm saying if I go into the pedagogy of the critical, the people, my brother thought I made a blackdom. So I, I had to figure out a way to translate it. And then five years later, okay, so the, the, let me just, conclude, I'm gonna end on this. Five years later, after graduating from UTEP, so I graduated in 2015, or about four years later, I went to the WHA and my brother came, he lives in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, and he finally figured out that I didn't make up Blackdom. So it's possible uh, to get people who are totally oblivious to even engage in what we do if we engage them first, okay? Don't ask people to come to you, bring it to them. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I, I, I think that's a very um, excellent note to end on that we need to be mindful of the ways that we're talking to each other and the ways that we are um, languaging, languaging and practicing um, as scholars, as artists, as historians, as like you said earlier, whatever your job is, um, what, is the, what is your um, method of resistance? And, yes. and, and one more thing, vulnerability. I didn't know how, how, how important it was to be, I'm a black man from Compton and vulnerability is a weakness. So when you engage this work, you have to be vulnerable, including being challenged and having to go, oh, okay, 
oh, okay, I can't say the F word, you know, F-A-G. You know, oh, I can't say that anymore. No, don't. It's, it's not important to get mad. It's important for all of us to be in this diversity. Okay, the, 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 the intersectionality has to come out in those in the in the different interactions, whether it's words or pictures or whatever. So yeah, I'm I'm done, but yes, that's my that's the last of what I where I go with that. Um I like how you say we're in the work. It's 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 complex, it's messy, um, but but it's fruitful. Thank you so much for our conversation today. I look forward to more conversations with you. Uh, so this wraps up our time together, everyone. Um, please share this talk and others um, in the series with your contacts. Um, in the next couple of days, Dr. Nelson's uh, dialogue will be up on the website, uh, chicano.nmsu.edu, where, we, where we're hosting the recordings. Um, our next dialogue will be on March 31st with Dr. Rabab Abdulhadi. She's a professor of ethnic studies, race and resistance studies, and the director of the Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diasporas Initiative at San Francisco State University. Um, I'd love to get all these uh, speakers together, so stay tuned. I'm going to see if we can get a panel in the fall. Um, Dr. Abdulhadi's talk is titled Palestine and Ethnic Studies, Pedagogical Practice, and the Indivisibility of Justice. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful evening and thank you so much for your your time and energy dr nelson have a good night but bye bye <laughs> uh, yeah. i will thank you <laughs> later thank you thank you